Hello, and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Nonfiction Authors Association. Com. It's a supportive community where writers connect, exchange ideas, and learn how to write, market, publish, promote, and profit with your nonfiction books. Since 2010, the NFAA has hosted the Nonfiction Writers Conference, a three-day event conducted entirely online. Yes, we were ahead of our time. I'm Carla King, your host, and here's a quick tip to jumpstart your day, no matter where you are in your author journey. Just navigate to nonfictionauthorsassociation.com and grab one or more of our free reports. For example, how to grow your email list, how to generate book reviews, get a traditional book deal, self-publish, boost sales on Amazon, and so much more. And you can join our email list by text message. Get the help you need by picking up your phone and texting the letters NFAA to phone number 22. 22- Eight two eight, and you'll get automatically signed up for our email list. That's NFAA to phone number 22828. And now stay tuned for our guest expert with tips to help you succeed as a nonfiction author. Hello, and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Podcast. I'm Carla King, your host, talking with Kristen Tate today about how to use the Editorial Freelancers Association to hire an editor. That's the EFA. Kristen Tate is the events chairperson for the EFA, and she's also the owner and lead editor at the Blue Garrett, which is an editorial editorial, I can't say the word, services firm that helps authors transform their work from rough draft to finished book. She has a PhD in English from Columbia University with a focus on publishing history, and she's the author of All the Words, A Year of Reading About Writing. Kristen writes a regular newsletter full of craft advice and encouragement for authors. And at the end, we'll tell you how to get to all of your websites. Hi, Kristen. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Carly. It's so nice to be here. We'll start with the EFA audiences and then delve into, you know, how it works for authors and editors. Um, I wanted to just start with first, what are the benefits for authors who are seeking editors from an organization rather than searching outside of an organization with referrals and, you know, on all those service websites and all that? Yeah. Should they do both? Well, so I'm a big proponent for for both, you know, especially if you're talking about referrals, right? So if you have um, author friends, colleagues, people you've networked with, people you've met at a conference, and especially if they're writing in a similar genre as you, like if if you're writing a business book and they've written a business book, getting a referral from them is golden. Like that's the, you know, place to start for sure. That said, I also really encourage folks to talk to more than one editor, even though it's, you know, it's more work. I think people feel hesitant to take our time and we are busy and this part of our job is unpaid. But at the same time, it's important for everyone in the relationship to know it's a good fit. And the way you know it's a good fit and build trust is by talking to a few different folks and just some of it is just gut and seeing um, you know, seeing what feels right. Um, it feels like it's almost like dating, you know, you have to to talk on the phone, you have to go on a few dates, you have to figure out if you're going to have a, cause it's a long, it can be a long relationship. It can be. And you're trusting them with something that's really important. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you're talking about, you know, a book in particular, you know, that is months and months of, of work typically. And it's something that you're going to be promoting for years to come. And so it's a really important relationship and it's worth, um, it's worth taking the time in the search to, to feel really good that you found someone who's a good fit. And then in terms of, you know, the EFA in particular, as opposed to, you know, using a kind of freelancer site, that's more general, like, uh, you know, like Upwork or something like that. The, The biggest benefit, I think, from an author standpoint is that, um, so we have a directory for one. So you're, you're, you're already kind of focusing and specializing, um, with folks who, who work on words and work on books. Um, and then within that directory, uh, it's broken down by all of these subcategories, everything from ghostwriting to indexing, to, um, sensitivity reading to different kinds of, of editing. And that's just not something you can't do that kind of, uh, search on a more generalist site. Um, and then the other yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I just I wanted to develop uh, delve into those particular 
editing types a little yeah. bit later. And you had one more thing. I was going to ask you what are the benefits for editors, but you have one more thing about authors. Well, so the other, the other really great part, it's all free. And then there's also a free oh. job list service. So um, for authors, you can you can kind of describe your book, describe your budget, your timeline, all of that kind of thing, and the the type of person you're looking for. So this is really great if you've got a very specific kind of niche subject and you would like someone who might have some subject matter expertise in there. That's a really great way to find a, a quick match. Um, and then for editors, there are a lot of benefits. So as you know, we were kind of talking about it before we, we, um, we went live here. I joined the EFA pretty much the instant I decided I was going to start freelancing. Um, and I had, I had no clients. Um, so this was a really big way for me to start getting clients. So, you know, we, as members of the EFA, we, we're the ones who pay essentially. So we're kind of, you know, the, the organization is run by on member funds, uh, member dues. And, you know, the biggest benefit uh, is that job list, you know, so I started out really by seeing those things come in and responding to the ones that I thought I was qualified for. And that was a big way I, I started my, my business uh, several years ago. So, and then um, other benefits for the organization for editors include there's a lot of professional development opportunities um, and also networking. So we all, I have, I'm based in San Francisco and um, I'm the co-coordinator of the, our San Francisco chapter. So we meet regularly over Zoom and in person um, to, you know, kind of learn about editing topics and just just meet one another and network. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I was looking at the website, which is at the-efa.org, by the way, um, I also noticed there's a lot of training included with the membership. Like there was one about um, editing uh, sexuality, editing medical, edit editing legal. Yep. So, and some of them were free to the editors who are members and some of them are I, I suppose deeper level and paid. Yeah, exactly. So there, there are a lot of kind of hour long uh, webinars that are free to members. One of my favorite ones was, you know, the beginning of the pandemic when I think we, you know, just like everyone else, we were all panicking, like, are, are our clients going to disappear? Um, the EFA put together a, a webinar about kind of how to recession proof your business and ideas for that. So there are a lot of um, a lot of benefits there. And then I this was also how I upskilled. So I came from a kind of academic background and I had taught college writing. But I didn't have the skills when I started editing to uh, do developmental editing of fiction. And I really, that's something I really wanted to do. So I took, um, it was actually kind of a, a sequence of classes that took me about a year to get through um, for developmental editing. So they're they're really in-depth and they really do give you the skills you need to, you know, provide the services you want. Wow, that's pretty valuable. And it's valuable to the author as well. Yeah. Um, the fact that you network in your industry and you're always training. Um, yeah. So this is the thing, you know, when I, I, I'm pretty aware of the different types of editing, developmental, copy editing, line editing, structural editing, proofreading and all of that. But a lot of writers aren't, um, they, many writers think that they just need copy editing when they might actually need a developmental editor. And I always get this, these terms mixed up. Can, can you clarify for me? Um, I, like, I think that developmental structure, structural is about the same. And then line and copy editing are about the same. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, it, okay. I have to say, like, we freelance editors make it a little harder because <laughs> we all have slightly different definitions of, of all of those terms. So the best thing to do is, you know, when you have when you've identified a few possible editors, like take a look at their websites. Most of us have websites and see how they define those services. But broadly, I would put, you know, content editing, structural editing, developmental editing into one bucket. And that's, you know, if you need kind of... Um, big picture feedback on your book. If you're not sure if you have um, really carried out your, your argument, or maybe you're concerned that your examples are not as effective as um, it could be, or the organization feels a little fuzzy or off, or you just, you know, maybe it's your first book and you want that kind of thorough level of, um, 
you know, of, of feedback from someone. Uh, so that's where you would start. And I do think it's a great thing to do at least once, um, you know, in your, in your author career, especially if you think you're going to write more than, more than one book, you just, you'll learn a lot about how to put a book together and also kind of what else the book could be. Right. Um, and then in terms of copy editing and line editing, those again, get a little fuzzy, um, but they're both about kind of sentence level stuff. Like, you know, when I'm copy editing, I'm actually working on a copy edit today and I'm going through it sentence by sentence. I'm making sure everything is clear, correct, consistent, our spellings are right. You know, I, you know, the national mall is kind of where it's supposed to be in the story that's set in, in Washington, DC, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then, Line editing, I do them, these two things simultaneously. Some editors do them separately, but line editing to me is about polishing. Like, is this sentence as good as it can be? Would it be better if we broke it up or combined it? Or, you know, maybe it needs to be in a different paragraph. We deleted it entirely. I know yeah, that I, I was absolutely. doing some peer editing for a, a colleague last week and um, it was a great piece but there was a lot of redundancy. So I was feeling really bad because I was like, delete, 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 delete. And the piece really ended up being a lot stronger because she was, she was uh, telling the audience too much where they could fill in those blanks and the, it could have been faster paced. Is that yeah. is line and copy editing where a lot of these big deletions happen? Yeah. I mean, it can be, I mean, I definitely also, you know, often advise those at the content um, you know, mm -hmm. level as well. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think the way to think, I think about it as an editor, and I think it's helpful for authors to think about it too, is you want to think about that end reader, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with deletions, those can be painful. I don't know how your colleague, you know, kind of reacted to that, but it's hard to have like written, like each She's sentence done it to me too. Hard. I know we do it to each other all the time. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, you have to have a special relationship with somebody to keep doing that for sure. You do. <laughs> Um, well, okay. We could talk about that forever too, but, um, yeah, to get back to the different kinds of editors, when I looked on the site, I was like, wow, you guys have project managers and fact checkers and indexers and translators and ghostwriters too. Um, so I couldn't have, in fact, maybe get a project manager for, is that the publishing process as well? Yeah, absolutely. We do have members who are doing that. You know, there are so many uh, people, you know, venturing into self-publishing in particular, and those steps can be, there are a lot of them, as you know, like it's a very steep learning curve. And so we do have members who um, work with that kind of client. We also have a lot of folks who work with um, larger publishers um, and, you know, manage a lot of projects on a freelance basis, get it, getting them kind of through a specific part of the process, perhaps. Um, yeah. And yeah. And last week I, I wanted to mention that I interviewed the book designers Ian Koviak and Alan Hebel, and they work with a bunch of traditional publishing houses like Simon and Schuster and, you know, the biggies. And it's so nice to be able to have access to, to editors and designers who, who really, are working with the the pros, the big big publishing houses as well. Yeah, and you can definitely find that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think like many other industries, it's surprising um, how much the public, you know, the big five rely on freelancers. So many of us are, you know, you can hire the same freelancer that Simon and Schuster is, uh, you know, using for their books. So we're out, we're out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I did hire, I think a year or maybe two years ago, a, a copy editor from the EFA. And it was a kind of, a, it was ended up to be a good experience, but it was pretty intense at first because I'm not sure that I, like with the book designers, they told me, you know, the more details, like they have a design brief, the more details, the competitive analysis, your vision, and competitive analysis stuff. They want to know that. I'm not sure I knew that. And I don't think that I actually expressed that in my, in the form that I filled out. So I got like, like 200 you know, people um, replying. And then I went, oh, okay. So then I just, you know, it was pretty labor intensive because I didn't do that upfront work um, to find the right editor. But I did, I, I found actually four or five 
but only two were available in the time frame that I needed. And I just, you know, went with my gut after having phone conversations with them. Yeah. Is that a normal experience? I mean, it's very I normal. kind of blow it. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I, it's hard. I, you know, it's, it's, people feel intimidated and they, they really shouldn't like we're out here. We're, you know, waiting for clients. Many of us, I, I would say I hear a lot from people who have a pretty tight time frame, and I am generally booked out like right now, I'm not taking anyone until March or April. So that's how far I'm booked out. Um, you know, other, but there are, there are editors who that's not the case. And the, so this is where the job list is fantastic. So, you know, even if you need a, a very tight turnaround within a couple of weeks, as long as you put that in the, in your, in your brief that you send on the, on the job list, you'll find someone who is, uh, is ready to help you. So that's a big advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is, but it is, you know, you have to be prepared for that sort of deluge of, um, of responses, right? Yes. 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 So that is a good, so maybe if I had said, I need this done in three weeks, instead of having it open-ended, I would, I would have been, uh, yes. you know, fewer emails that I And got. I would say too, you know, recognize, you know, I, I, you know, I don't generally reply to those anymore, but you know, back when I did, don't feel like you need to reply to if you get a hundred responses um, or even a couple dozen, you know, respond to the ones that look good. The rest of us are not out there. You know, we, we send out that email, but we're not, we're not waiting for you to reply. So it's okay. Pull the ones out that look great. Even if you're just kind of looking through the, the first 20 or so that come in, that's a good representative sample and that's fine. And just thank you for that move on. because, yes. you know, we feel sort of a moral obligation to respond to, to everyone. Right. And it is yeah. ex- exhausting. So we, thanks. yeah, we get it. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, so also regarding payment. Now I send people to your payment, uh, chart page all the time because I mean, I know rates vary. So I have two questions regarding payment. One is, um, um, you already said, uh, editors pay to be part of the members. So it's free for authors, yeah. but does the EFA handle payments like Upwork or is it privately between you and the editor? It's privately between you and the editor and, mm. you know, and the, that rate chart is handy. Um, you know, it's going to really vary, you know, it's, you know, this is why if you're, especially if you're doing the job list and, you know, you're on a tight budget, putting that budget in there is good. Um, some of us, I live in San Francisco, which is unfortunately, as you well know, very expensive, um, you know, and so, and I'm, and I'm more experienced now than I was when I started out. So, you know, it, it's like anything else, like you're going to have to balance, um, balance what you want, but that rate chart is a good, um, a good starting point. I will also say a lot of editors, not all editors, but many of us do have rates on our website. So -hmm. that's another argument for at least kind of getting a handful to look at. And then you could have some rates to just see what the, what the range is. And that'll give you a better sense of, um, what kind of budget you're going to need for your project. And then where various folks fit in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you can look at those rates and some of them very wildly. Um, but there's also, I saw, and I didn't really delve into it, a hiring basics that I'm not sure was there when I, or maybe I just ignored it when I was desperate for an editor, (laughs) um, uh, that, uh, helps. Um, and I was also kind of surprised to see, oh, this is great. Um, if you'd like a freelancer to take an editing test, please see our testing guidelines here. So that was kind of cool. Now, um, I know some, some editors, you know, require, do require some payment for their time, but others might do a free sample edit. Yeah, absolutely. I, so that's what I do for my own business. Again, it varies widely. Um, I know some editors will charge a small fee, that then if you go on to work together is typically deducted from the cost of the edit. Um, You know, I, for me, this is a win-win. So yes, it does take time. I set aside an hour to do those. Um, But it's important for me to feel like, um, to kind of test out, how do I feel about this book? Do I think I can add the value I'd want to add um, for this writer? Do I, you know, do I feel a connection with the subject matter? Um, and I also want, again, like there's so much 
trust required in this relationship. Like you're inviting someone in to kind of, you know, tool with your argument and give you feedback on, you know, big picture issues and move sentences around and maybe delete them. You really need to trust that person. And in my experience that that's what the sample edit does, right? You get to see, um, you know, what an editor is going to do to a a piece of your work. And I, you know, highly encourage people to send, you know, send out a chunk of the actual manuscript that they're, they're hiring for. Um, Editing tests are, I think, useful for organizations like publishers. I think they're less useful for individual authors. I think you really want to see what different editors are going to do with your work. And again, it's fine to, like, don't ask for 10 sample edits, but asking for two or three, so you can really get a sense of um, how, like we all do things differently. I have a different editing style and a different editing voice than some other folks do. And that's how you're going to get your gut sense that like, oh, this is the one, you know, this person yeah. gets it. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think it's also important, right, to send the same chapter to each of the editors. Yep. Right. Yep. So you can Absolutely. really clearly see that difference. Yeah. Right. Agreed. See if they're going to be like me and cut every other sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, you know, you might need that. You know, I definitely yeah. have, uh, you know, had authors come to me with like a 200,000 word novel and mm-hmm. they need help cutting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know. And I do know an awful lot of uh, authors. Um, I had somebody come to me uh, recently and this is, not uncommon. Um, I, I, I have my book, I'm ready to publish. It's 500 pages. I'm like, uh, have you employed an editor <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you don't want an autobiography. Maybe you want a few memoirs or <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you have a thriving, um, editorial business are, uh, like, do you dive in and out of the EFA? Do things get slow? Or I mean, what, how do you use it now? I know you're the events manager, so you're very yeah. involved. So, but what do you see um, in the world yeah. of editors? I mean, so right now, so the thing I'm really excited about that I'm involved in right now is as part of this events um, committee, we're launching a speakers bureau initiative. So um, in addition to attending conferences like the San Francisco Writers Conference or something like that and having exhibitors table and being there to answer questions, which we do and we really enjoy. I love uh, doing that table. We're also sending out speakers who are editors and can you know, speak on exactly this topic of um, of how to find and work with an editor, because I think, mm-hmm. you know, just to demystify it, to humanize it, um, to answer a lot of the questions that we're talking about now. So that's what I'm really excited about. Um, I don't, re- I don't really respond to the job ads so much anymore. Um, I kind of leave that to the, like, there's always new folks coming in and who are hungry for that. Um, but I do, you can also find me in the directory and people do find me that way. And so if I, um, you know, if someone contacts me directly and it seems like they will be a good fit, then I do end up with, uh, uh, getting, getting work through the EFA that way. Mm-hmm. And you do have events coming up and they're ostensibly for, uh, editors, but I, I mean, I'm kind of interested as an author, I'm both an author and an editor, um, authenticity reading, what it is and why editors should care. I'm not even sure that most, um, authors know what authenticity reading is. Is that sensitivity reading? Yep. Yeah. Uh It's another Mm -hmm. word for it. Some people kind of prefer that term. It feels a little less, um, freighted maybe I think. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. And um, you have things like editing in Google Docs, you know, which is a virtual meeting. I, you know, it feels like every time I teach a course or run a workshop, I have to have, you know, how to edit in Google Docs. So um, these are, these are really, I I would, I would encourage the authors to even look at the events um, that are here as well. Absolutely. And I will say also like many authors make good editors. So if that's something you're interested in, you know, attending one of these events will give you a sense of, you know, you know, who our membership is and how these meetings work and just, you know, give you a a little taste of whether this is something you would like to do, you know, alongside your, your writer business. And just um, one more question. And uh, I'd like to go on to what you're doing and what the FA is uh, doing in the near future and how we can get a hold of you. 
But, um, you know, I've used writing groups for developmental editing um, and beta readers as well. Yeah. Um, for both memoir and my how-to books. Um, I, I haven't yet used a developmental editor, but the more I talk to developmental editors, the more I'm interested in paying that money and, and, and doing it. Um, but then I know, I think that that editor can't also be the copy editor because they're too close. Right. And then there's the proofreader. So you might have three editors in your, the lifespan of your book. Is that right? It really depends. So for me personally, I do copy edit books that I have done developmental editing for. So some, some editors don't, and there are also lots of editors who do just one or the other. I really like having that balance of both because they, to me, they use different parts of my brain. Mm -hmm. Um, what I don't do then is go on to proofread something that I've either that I've done any kind of work on, because I really believe strongly that if you're going to um, hire a proofreader, you really want someone who's coming to it totally fresh. So that's that's where I do the division. Um, and I would just say, too, you know, when you're thinking about developmental editing, um, there are there are kind of different stripes of that. So, you know, for example, I offer what I call a manuscript evaluation and many editors do this. It's you know, it's a single read through and you get an editorial letter um, with comments. So, you know, you're a very experienced author and that might be, you know, might be enough for me to say, you know, in this part of the book, I, you know, I feel like the the pacing is off and here's some ideas for how you can fix it. And you might then be able to go off and execute that. Whereas a brand new author, you know, might need something more extensive that includes uh, comments directly on the manuscript that'll show them exactly how, okay, like these three paragraphs are where it really feels like it gets tied up to me. And what do you think about breaking them out into another chapter or maybe deleting them or, you know, just, uh, you know, more kind of hands-on specific feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's something, you know, you're considering, you know, think about how much feedback uh, you need and there's cost differences too. So, you know, there are, you know, manuscript evaluation is budget wise a more accessible op option for people. Yeah. You know, I'm actually really interested in that. Um, <clears throat> the manuscript evaluation, I think it would also give me a really good idea of how I could work with an editor. Right. Yeah. Um, I've seen them as low as $500 and as high as like several thousand. Um, <laughs> yes. That sounds you know, accurate. I know, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. And, you know, these are for editors who, you know, edited, uh, you know, um, really best selling books. So right. you get a lot of value from that because part of the reason you, the, the developmental editor is so important, um, I think, is because of their industry knowledge as well. So you want to ask them about that, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not, it's, it's not even, it's not connection so much as it is. Um, do they know the publishing landscape and do they know the landscape for your genre, right? Do they know what reader expectations are for your genre? So in a lot of cases, you really do want to, to find an editor who works on your kind of book. You know, for example, I don't work on, I really don't work on business books because um, that's not, that's not my, my background. Um, you know, I don't work on horror novels because I'm a complete coward and I don't read horror novels. So you, you want to find someone who really knows your, your genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, it used to be that editors, you know, almost made the author, right. There are some certain famous editors that really worked hard with them. And, um, those days might be over or you just might have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that is what's happening, right. We're hearing that, you know, agents and in-house editors are, they're working harder than ever and they have less time and that's exactly why uh, many folks are going with freelance editors because they, you yeah. know, they need to have someone who's going to be able to give them that dedicated time. Right. And I even heard a very famous author say um, that she hires an editor before she gives the book to the publisher to edit because, you know, they're not doing the same things that they used to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, so sad. Boo -hoo. <laughs> well, Kristen, so what else should we know about the EFA? And also, what else should we know about you? Yeah, sure. You know, so the EFA, I would say, you know, go check out the website. There's, um, you know, on the top, there's a, a menu item that says hire a freelancer. And that's where you'll find everything that I mentioned. Um, and that, you know, including that hiring basics link that you mentioned. So there are a lot of resources. So even if you're just starting to think about it, it's worth taking a look and seeing what's there um, and just kind of starting to educate yourself a little bit. Um, so and then the blue the garret. Evening. I yeah. want to know where, where did that come from? That name? <laughs> I, so I was living in an actual blue garret when I started yeah. my business um, and this top of this little uh, building over in the mission in San Francisco. And I named it after that. So I was kind of getting a fresh start and that's where I was living. And um, and then I, I, I've moved and now still have like a bedroom at the top of my, my current place that is blue and has like the sloped attic walls. So, which is when I knew I, I needed to live in this house. Sweet. Um, so that's where it started. Yeah. So that's special to me. So that's where you can find me. I'm at, um, the blue Um, I have a weekly newsletter, so I'm doing kind of deep dive novel studies, uh, right now. Um, I'm getting ready, I think to launch a new project that's going to be a kind of chapter by chapter breakdown of an Agatha Christie novel next year. So that's what we're going to do. So mystery writers out there might want to um, get on board for that. Oh, fun. You know, it's so funny. There's a lot of memoir too that have mystery elements to it. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm seeing more and more. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hey, thank you so much for demystifying the editing process and ha helping us navigate the EFA. That's, um, again, the dash EFA dot org. Thanks so much, Carla. It was a pleasure. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. The podcast live streams weekly with monthly top replays from our archive of over 400 interviews, many of which are really still relevant today. You can find out how to listen or watch at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com slash podcasts. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get reminders and all kinds of good stuff nonfiction authors need to write, publish, promote, and profit from your books. Meantime, keep writing. The world needs your experience and expertise. Hey, just a couple more things. You can join our email list by text message now. Get the help you need by picking up your phone and texting the letters NFAA to phone number 22828. That's 22828 with the message NFAA and you'll get automatically signed up for our email list. Also, we have some great sponsors for the NFAA and for the Nonfiction Writers Conference, including lulu.com. Check them out. Looking for a better way to grow your brand and business? Lulu can help. Use our free platform to publish in all of the best-selling formats, including hardcover and coilbound, and connect to our global print network to sell your books directly through your own website. Lulu's e-commerce integrations with Shopify and WordPress allow you to sell your books your way. Create a free account today at lulu.com to get started. Still around? Great. I wanted to mention a few previous podcast episodes that you might be interested in. I talked with Alan Hebel and Ian Koviak, the book designers, on how to work with book interior and cover designers on... That's November 16th. On November 9th, I talked with Jordan Rosenfeld, an editor and writer on how to use backstory and flashback scenes in creative nonfiction. Also related is in October 5th, Lauren Eckhart, How Your Unique Story Can Connect with Thousands. On August 24th, Marike McCandless on how to cultivate right now mind using free writing techniques to improve your nonfiction. And finally, on June 15th, Jana Maron on how to finally finish your book, Three Shifts to Make It Happen. So those are some crafty, edity, and uh, hiring episodes that I thought you'd be interested in if you liked this episode. Thanks, and stay in touch. You can reach me at Carla at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. I hope you do.